Welcome back. I went through all 32 NFL teams to figure out exactly how their coaches affect your fantasy football teams. Today's episode, the New York Giants. So take a seat, classes in session. They definitely made some moves in the offseason, and I'm not entirely sure I would say they filled those gaps in free agency and the draft. At this second in time, it looks like the coaches are the same. We got Don Martindale running the defense where his specialty is linebackers, and we have both Brian Dable and Mike Kafka leading the offense. Brian Dable's specialty kind of ranges all over the place, whether that be wide receivers, quarterbacks, or tight ends. This is seen with his time with the Patriots, the Jets, the Browns, the Dolphins, the Chiefs, the Bills, and now the Giants. Mike Kafka's specialty is the overall quarterbacks. Now that we've laid the foundation for exactly how the New York Giants have attacked this offseason, we can start to dive into exactly how the coaches affect our various fantasy teams. But before we do that, we need to check with the guys upstairs to see exactly how they have the New York Giants projected to go about this season so we can give our knowledge a little bit more structure. The New York Giants are projected to go somewhere between 7 and 8 wins this year, but it looks like they in theory have no shot of making the playoffs. So I think we have to be a little bit more pessimistic on them as well. Especially when you see what the storm is kind of brewing with Saquon's contract deal. He might not even play week one, we gotta see how that plays out, but the overall history for running backs when the longer they kind of sell out is not the strongest trend. Right now I do have my concerns with this Giants team, but I think they're gonna be a positive off game scripts to where at least the receiving core, so to speak here, does really well in fantasy. So now that we've got a really strong understanding of the general direction in which the New York Giants are headed this season, we can start to dive into exactly how both Brian Dable and Mike Kafka affect our various fantasy teams. And I think you're going to be a little bit more optimistic than most here. Looking at the quarterback position, we got Daniel Jones, otherwise known as Danny Dimes. Look at the two charts here. It seems to be an overall uptrend underneath these coordinators. There's a chance that Danny Dimes is a top 10 fantasy quarterback this year, especially with the game scripts that he'll be having, but I'm not going to be super high on him just yet, but I am picking him up a lot in fantasy drafts. Looking at his advanced efficiency metrics, they're also very nice to see, but I don't really like to nitpick off of efficiency metrics too much. I think that kind of leads you in the wrong direction from time to time, so I don't want to fully rely on that, but seeing that he was number one in true completion percentage, along with being number three in red zone completion percentage with the weapons that he theoretically has now, it's hard not to kind of start getting behind him a little bit, especially considering the negative game scripts that they're likely about to have. And I'm sorry if I'm too back and forth on what's negative and positive, it's hard for me to elaborate too much on what that exactly is. But to try to summarize it, it's basically if you're playing from behind, you're going to be throwing the ball a lot more, trying to get more action going. Kind of same uh, positive is more uh, for like receivers and quarterbacks kind of throwing, if that makes sense, and running ball. Whereas like running backs, positive game scripts mean that you're up and you're actually winning those games. So you're so to speak going to be utilizing the run game a lot more, if you will. I don't know. To sum it all up, just check out his advanced efficiency metrics. I think an 18 fantasy point floor for Danny Dimes this year is very safe. And I wouldn't be surprised if he blows it out of the water with the amount of rushing attempts he has. And more than likely will have the Saquon Barkley is not playing. And I'm a little bit concerned about this offensive line, but hey, I'm not an offensive line expert. Moving over to the RB1, and that is Saquon Barkley. The trends are both rather positive here. I think a 15 fantasy point floor at the bare minimum for someone like Saquon is just, yeah, it's the bare minimum. But considering we don't really know what's going on with him at this point in time in terms of like when he's going to sign, we have to start kind of drawing back our overall expectations for how well he theoretically is going to perform this season. I don't have the data in front of me, but basically the longer you hold out on your contract as a running back, the worst case in scenario it looks for your overall efficiency. Moving over to the RB2, and that is Matt Breida. The charts point to where it's an overall downtrend, but I think it's going to spike up a little bit here because it looks like we're not going to see too much Saquon at this second in time, but that could easily change and he signs the contract and everything's happy dandy. But I'm going to keep it simple and say we're probably going to expect about an 8 fantasy point per game floor depending upon exactly how the Saquon scenario plays out. Moving over to the listed wide receiver 1, and that is Isaiah Hodgins. Wide receiver 1's fare pretty well in this offensive system and go about 15 fantasy points per game. I think he showed a lot of nice things towards the end of last season, but I don't think he's going to be their true wide receiver one. I think whoever's the wide receiver one is going to be the wide receiver two in this offense, but I'll get into that once I get into the tight end position. And yes, I'm believing that the tight end here is going to be the true wide receiver one, but as I said, we'll save that for a little later. So going off the charts, we're going to go with whoever the wide receiver one here is 15 fantasy points per game, because I also don't believe it's Isaiah Hodgins. I realistically believe it's Paris Campbell, but we're going to save him because he's technically at the wide receiver three part. Moving over to the wide receiver two, that is currently sought to be Darius Slayton. Charts aren't the best thing here, but I think 10 fantasy points per game makes a lot of sense. And I really do think that fits more with someone like Isaiah Hodgins than it does Darius Slayton. And we're going to kind of see an inverse flip kind of going on here once we get closer to the season. Because if you're looking at how things are going in drafts as well, it seems like no one has any idea who's going to be the true wide receiver one in that offense. And right now, Paris Campbell and Isaiah Hodgins are essentially neck and neck. Moving over to the wide receiver three and where there's a massive drop off, and that should be Paris Campbell in theory. Now, I do believe that in terms of the actual position rankings, Paris Campbell will be the true wide receiver one on this offense. 
So going off the charts here, whoever's in the wide receiver three slot should be averaging about eight fantasy points per game, if not less. But the reason I believe that Paris Campbell is likely going to be the true wide receiver one over there is more off of his contract than anything. He has the most expensive contract out of all the wide receivers there, which isn't the thing that's going to guarantee anything, right? But he's jumping into year five, which is typically a pretty good year for receivers. And on top of that, he had a really nice kind of season last year, in my personal opinion. And it looks like the Giants were willing to kind of pay a little bit of money. And we look at the advanced efficiency metrics for Danny Dimes. There's a lot of kind of good correlation factors. You look at training camp. He had a drive where he had four straight passes straight to Paris Campbell, albeit that's just nitpicking a little bit too much. But perhaps this is nitpicking too much. And maybe I'm just diving a little bit too much in a rabbit hole here. But I saw that he had 55, 65, and 75 as part of his incentive targets, I want to say. Perhaps 75 was like a little high on there, but like, I don't know, he gets $200,000. And when you look at kind of how the season's set up and how much they're probably going to have to be passing this year, I think that's definitely possible. And th I want to, keyword, I want to say he's the only receiver that I know that has that kind of contract stipulation on this team, but I could be very wrong on that. So don't hold me to that, but that was something nitpicky that I saw that was like interesting. Um, and typically once we get towards the end of the seasons, that's where we have to start like paying attention to that kind of stuff. You feel me? Now moving over to the tight end, that is Darren Waller. As you can see off of the coaching trends here, it is very positive, but for the most part, it's been in a downtrend. Now, why has it been in a downtrend? I think that's primarily because they haven't had a true tight end one for them in quite some time. And they went out and got Darren Waller, albeit it was a rather cheap acquisition. But Darren Waller has been that guy in the past. And I think he got injured the season prior to this one. And I just don't think Josh McDaniels really let him run through. But I just don't think these past two seasons have really been who Darren Waller is. And going off of trends, this likely will bounce back rather than go down. And if you have to look at any tight end that you can get right now, he has the best value out of all of them. And something I'll kind of reference for you here is that Mike Dable and uh, Brian Kafka have both worked with top tier tight ends in their histories. One with Gronk, one with Travis Kelsey. And now you're getting someone like Darren Waller who's had some top tier tight end finishes. I don't see why this can't go to 15 fantasy points per game. He's an absolute body and I think he's a lot better than people are expecting. Yes, he's a bit on the older side, but I think that's also what people are trying to make the argument about Travis Kelsey to some extent. Travis Kelsey's 33, but I think the true kind of formula you really need to look for for like finding a top tier tight end one is finding elite talent that's really the only true target on that team. I mean, look at the Kansas City Chiefs last year, right? They didn't really have a true like wide receiver one. Juju was the closest thing they had and they just went out and got Kadarius Tony. I think he's going to be very intriguing as well. And now D-Hop's potentially in the situation dependent upon Chris Jones and everything. But I think that there's a very real possibility, especially based off of how ADP is going with how far back the receivers are and uh, how forwards uh, Darren Waller is in the draft that he's their true wide receiver one. And he may be seeing eight to 10 targets per game. And that's what we want. Albeit that is an egregiously high amount, but it's in the realm of possibility for someone like him. And I think we're all kind of in agreement here that this Giants team is probably not going to be as good as we would like it to be. So they're probably going to be playing from behind, meaning in terms of game script, that's very positive for the receiving game. Does this lead to touchdown efficiency and everything? Probably not. But when you're looking at like half PPR settings and stuff like that, I think the risk reward is there. And I think you should be buying as much of it as you can. And I'm personally going to be buying some in the off season once I have a little bit more liquidity in my pockets. So just to recap, I don't think this Giants team is going to be great, but I do think there's a chance that they kind of surprise us all. I also think the NFC East is going to be a lot more competitive than people are giving it credit for. I'm not a Danny Dimes truther in any way. I just look at it more from a fantasy perspective. And I think since Darren Waller changed his number to 12, something that's bigger than him, he's playing for something bigger this season and we'll see that impact on the field. And you also have to think about like what potential storylines are going to come about this season. You know what I mean? So I, I'm very big on Darren Waller. I'm very big on Paris Campbell. I'm picking up some pieces of Danny Dimes here and there. So I have a little bit of share equity there. But I don't know. I think this team's a little bit of a buy when it comes to fantasy. And I really appreciate you guys sticking around. That's really all I have for today. Drop your fantasy football questions down in the comment section below. And if you like this video, make sure to drop a like and subscribe. We're going to be dropping a video on the Philadelphia Eagles tomorrow. But in the meantime, peace.